Okay, let's continue with a bit more on on risk because uh, <coughs> when you are when you are going to do uh, international or plan international transport services to sort of cope with risk issues is uh, almost inevitable. I think there is always some risks involved <coughs> in a, in a in a transport supply chain, which which needs to be be addressed in a way. Uh, <coughs> mitigating supply risk disruptions. There are various ways that can be can be uh, that can be done in various ways. You have <coughs> you have um, a product strategy, means that you can, which means that you can change the product <coughs> configuration to meet customer demand during a supply dis disruption. Uh, this uh, cell phone producer changed the product configuration after uh, um, suppliers' uh, plant burnt down in 2000. So they ran out of specific uh, uh, components, so they needed to, to change the product configuration. And that is easy to say, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> it is a lot easier to change configuration if you are thinking in ter terms of modularization of the product. That you can have modules, pro product consists of modules, and if something goes wrong with one module, you can cha change that one and leave the rest more or less unchan un unchanged. So modularization makes it easier to both <coughs> amend problems and also to uh, have a larger degree of freedom when it comes to supplier selection, if you can modula modularize uh, the product. Um, this is another uh, way, and, and these are sort of related because it's much easier to, to, to change a supply plan, to change a supply, uh, to, to replace one supply with another one, uh, if <coughs> you have this uh, modularized uh, production design in, in place, in the, in the first place. And this one is kind of interesting, and I touched upon that in, uh, in, uh, in an earlier lecture, that you can actually use the price mechanism to shift demand from one type of product to another. So if uh, <coughs> if you if you get problems in this case, it was pro problems with the, with the, with flat panel screens. This is uh, some years back, and, and, and back in 1999, you could choose between uh, old-fashioned screens and flat panels. Now everything has flat panels, so it's not an issue today. But at the time, it was, <coughs> and then they could. Then Dell gave discounts on the conventional screens, and the customers then shifted demands towards those instead, and they were able to continue their business and to to keep the sales <coughs> more or less up to 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 where it used to be. Postponement. <coughs> And this is uh, again what I what I touched upon this uh, this design which can allow for for uh, using other types of components. Uh, <coughs> you could also have strategic stock. In particular, when it comes to standard components of low unit value. That can be a, a good strategy because it's it's even if you l if you run out of basic cheap components as a caused by a kind of some kind of disruption, you cannot continue your production. 
it's of course much harder or much more expensive to have plant stockpiling of let's say more expensive components then you have to deal with that in other in other ways but for bits and pieces standard bits and pieces it could be a way to to mitigate risk this one has we have touched upon that already and that one make or buy it's that's make and buy but it should be make or buy means that <coughs> you could you should try to uh, this is this kind of involves uh, a slightly different kind of risk then we are back to let's say this one <coughs> relationship risk where um, you may want to keep strategic components or strategic services in-house instead of outsourcing it to a third party one example <coughs> from this region is uh, <coughs> ship design design of, of vessels where one of the <coughs> one of the main uh, shipyards ship makers <coughs> they outsourced their this the, their design division uh, to make it a separate entity and they soon observed that that separate design entity they took on jobs also for their competitors so this design consultancy then transferred knowledge from one competitor to another and I didn't like that too much so actually they were able to insource that activity again because they kept the ownership they outsourced into a separate entity separate firm but they kept, kept the ownership so they were able to take it back uh, in-house again and hence they got rid of the problem with spreading knowledge that could be a competitive advantage to this uh, to this shipyard or this uh, this shipmaker uh, <coughs> another mitigating strategy um, to have option agreements with suppliers to be able to to uh, to keep the business running and that can be a very good thing when you have agile an agile production structure where you are very uncertain about demand because there you have a demand risk in some cases not only supply risk but you can also have a, a type of <coughs> demand fluctuation that is uh, that is not um easy to foresee and hence it uh, represents a risk you can have a risk of short out or uh, stock out and uh, and uh, costs in terms of of foregone sales revenue flexible transportation <coughs> touched um, a bit upon that and we'll talk a bit more about that later on um, to try to set up routes where you have uh, backup possibilities this one has been mentioned already uh, <coughs> and this one's also type of related to to the pricing and uh, trying to shift demand to products that you actually have at hand <coughs> if we try to formalize this a bit just a bit we can say that we are now trying to 
just to simplify this uh, decision problem of uh, doing a kind of risk mitigation which costs has a certain cost so we can have an <coughs> we can have an uh, initial investment to invest in uh, better vehicles or uh, or uh, an extra let's say building for keeping safety stocks of some kind of whatever an initial investment <coughs> You may have a cost per year, uh, where I is from uh, one year one to we might perhaps the agreement period or the lifespan of the product or whatever. Let's call it N could be everything from 2 to not infinite but uh, a very high number and then you have the benefits per year and the benefits may be uh, For instance, sales revenues. Uh, it could also be uh, some kind of uh, cost saving. And what, what have you here? You could also <coughs> expand this since you are talking about risk. You could calculate C and B as expected values. Because you may have an expectation that the uh, cost per year may be high or low, benefits per year may be high and low, you don't know exactly, but based on data, your own experiences or, or uh, some kind of analysis of, uh, of available data, you can say something about expected values. You know how to calculate expected values? Yes, no, perhaps? I don't know quite, but let's say, <coughs> let's take an example. C is equal to 100. That is a, a basic estimate. But then <coughs> we could have good, medium, and bad outcome. And let's say that the medium is, is uh, has a, well, I should say that good could have a probability of 0 0.2, medium probability of 0 0.5, and the bad a probability of 0 0.3. Some probability is 1.0 and the medium has a value of 100 which is what we basically expect here good we're talking about cost so that should be a lower number could perhaps be 70 and bad 
if costs are really rocketing, they could, for, for instance, be 150, 50% up. And then <coughs> this results then in if we if we just multiply these numbers together, we get 14. We get 50. 0 0.5 times 100. 0 0.3 times 150 is 45. And the sum here is. 9, 109 in this case. Not too far from the what we have as a medium estimate. But this is the expected value based on uh, a triple estimate, good, medium, and bad outcome on the cost side. And the distribution of probabilities here depends on experience, how this normally will, or how this might turn out based on, uh, on, uh, on what you can analyze from, a, let's say, a set of data. I've been engaged in some cost overrun studies within the road sector when we talk about the road investments in Norway. And uh, <coughs> then we have used this probability distribution based on historical data on specific projects to, to do this calculation. So what we do then <coughs> when we are uh, doing this cost-benefit analysis is that we use expected values of costs and uh, the same can be done for the benefits. Calculate expected value or also on the of the benefits. So, <coughs> what we get from this is, uh, or what we can get from this is, uh, we can we can um, continue here with R as the demanded rate of return. on invested capital, for instance, or capital base, can be 7%. If you, if you are uh, engaged in a business where the average return on capital is 7%, could be something like that. <coughs> but then <coughs> the net present value, net present, net present value can then be set up as the investments and investments are always negative, it's a cost that they need to take. So the net present value is equal to the investment with the minus sign plus <coughs> the sum over the time period, be it, it can be only one year, but it can be a much longer t time period of benefits minus costs and I would add and I, I know you hate this again but I will I would add expected value of benefits minus expected value of costs divided by what we call a discount factor which is 
it is generally 1 plus r powered by i. So if, uh, when we, if you have a discount rate of, for example, for example, seven percent, R is equal to zero point zero seven divide. It's a percentage. So then one plus R becomes one point zero seven. So if you have an uh, initial investment and then the expected benefits minus the expected costs summarized over the time period of your product, let's say if you need to take some action to avoid risk for the coming 10 years, you get the summarization of 10 annual values here, discounted by means of this expression. In this case, 1.07 powered by 1, and the next year it's powered by 2, and the next third year powered by 3, and so on. what they call a profitable project. And this project could be risk, a risk mitigation issue. A profitable project should have net present value greater than zero. And I could also add one more thing. The expected value of the investments as well. Because investments in a mitigative action could have also a variation like this. I mean, if you are going to buy or to purchase an upgraded vehicle, a four-wheel drive lorry truck to avoid the consequences of bad roads, the expected value will probably be perhaps like the medium value because you know the, you know the price of such a vehicle. You know what size that investment might have. Might have. But you may take other, you need to take other in investment to avoid risk, which could have a spread with probabilities like this, and investment, amounts of investments spread like this, and then you get, you get an expected value at the end. Was this understandable? It's very, it's very convenient because uh, <coughs> in in real life you might be well able to 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 collect these numbers. In some cases it may be easy. It's not it's not necessary to to sort of do the calculations with a with a spread in probabilities because the the numbers are quite deterministic. But in other cases, they may be the, the, there may be a certain amount of uncertainty, which could well be taken into consideration by by calculating the expected values. <coughs> so, if you do this action by action, because you may have more than one possible risk mitigation strategy at hand, you do this analysis action by action or strategy by strategy and you choose the action which gives you the highest net present value. 
it should be greater than zero, but you, you choose the the great the largest one, which gives you the highest return. And you set the demanded return on invested capital here by choosing the discount rate. Seven percent is just an example. It could be ten, it could be five could be something that is in line with <coughs> what can be expected in that in that kind of industry that you are you are engaged in so this is just a chosen arbitrary it, it could could be could be another number and this is a generic framework you can use it for doing a cost-benefit analysis on almost everything that you can think of. But uh, it's also usable for, for uh, risk mitigation uh, projects. Then we change topic, or we proceed with um, uh, logistics implications of internalization. Some questions that we need to answer when we engage ourselves in, in international uh, supply chains or multinational supply chains. The inventory. Warehousing, should it be central or local? Depends a bit upon product differentiation, customization. Depends also a bit about on, on uh, on the structure of demand in the area that is planned to be covered by this uh, this warehouse or inventory. Come back to that. Handling, what kind of regulations do other countries have? Talked a bit about that, the EU, car makers and so on. Localization, production and suppliers has to do with the transportation network, has also to do with trade agreements. Um, and then the transport at the end here. Infrastructure quality, what type of modes you have at, at hand. HGV is heavy goods vehicles types. How can we make this supply chain work as seamless as, as, as possible? We see here how this internalization has developed over the years. Uh, period here, we see the drivers for internalization with labor shortage, labor costs, uh, <coughs> market entrance as, w as the free trade agreements came into, into play like the EU like the NAFTA in, uh, in uh, North America um, and also I think it involves like Latin America uh, and now a current uh, currently or it's uh, increased attention towards response responsiveness to customer orders the distance uh, could could mean something but also the way we organize the, the inventories. So come back to shift of labor and investments towards European countries without labor shortage. Um, in the 60s, the clothing industry disappeared from this region because it was a shift towards South Europe, Portugal, Italy, because at that time they were um, low-cost countries. We didn't have the global transport network as well functioning as we have now, so the low-cost, high-cost discussion was an at least in Europe, <coughs> uh, a, a discussion on uh, which took place, let's say, within the European continent. And then things started to expand. But uh, this has a very European perspective. 
apologize for that because some of you are from are not from from Europe but I think you you might find the same principles also also elsewhere but it's a strong focus now on back sourcing or home sourcing towards uh, towards uh, to setting up uh, industries in uh, also in emerging reindustrialization of Western Europe. We see the same pattern in the US. And why is that happen? happening? What could be one reason behind that type of development, this home sourcing to, to Europe or to the US? General Electric has started to produce uh, domestic electronics in, uh, I think it is in Chicago or Detroit again now. Started two years ago. Back sourcing from, uh, from China. Demand for higher quality? It could be a quality issue. More effective yes, especially that because when you are less dependent on labor because there has been a growing tendency of automation uh, using uh, you have replaced labor uh, labor with capital equipment robots things like that so <coughs> labor costs at least in certain types of production has it has gotten a lesser and lesser importance for some types of production. The reason why we still have car makers in, in Western Europe has to do with automation. And it has also been a strong development of uh, automation when it comes to production of uh, domestic electronics and things like that. Transport routes. <coughs> Continental, then we talk about Europe, within Europe, within North America, within South America, within Asia, Africa, and so on. But then from the 60s, and that is when the container came along. Container was invented, and in I think it was in the end of the 1950s. It's been increasingly in continental transport routes. Um, but then now, beginning to refocus on the continental aspect. So a very strong <coughs> focus on the European level on shifting from road to rail transport to use the inland waterways more efficiently uh, to avoid uh, road network congestion and to to uh, to make the transport more effective on the continental level. And if you are good at making forecasts, and uh, the authorities and uh, the big big companies are trying to to make forecasts, uh, then it is of course important. If you are getting this, if this development is really going to happen uh, to, a, to a very strong extent, you need also to, f to focus on the infrastructure. Because the demand for infrastructure services will become different in, in, in such cases. <coughs> the nature of international flows, um, physical distribution of finished products. Everything was sort of outsourced to low-cost countries. And then we start to get this division of labor, um, where you have production locations where you could do assembly of, uh, of uh, bits or parts, modules, that were produced elsewhere. Uh, <coughs> also physical distribution towards new market uh, regions. But now, the latest development, semi-finished products shipped to Europe, let's say the labor-intensive part of the production is shipped to Europe, where you can assemble it, 
it responds to customer orders. So there is a link here where you, <coughs> where you have a demand for shorter lead time. You produce in mod modules and you assemble the order on a very short notice. And that assembly is to a large extent then automized. So there has been a shift then from the earlier phase where everything was produced outside of the high cost region and to a much more diversified picture where the high cost region <coughs> can take care of the final assembly, engineering the order and everything that has a quite high willingness to pay from the end customer side and where the economies of scale can be exploited by using capital equipment. Because if you have, just to use this for a different purpose then, if you have a high investments and you have relatively low operating costs for using a, <coughs> let's say, automized production plant, then <coughs> it's, a, it's a very good thing to try to centralize and to to really make good use of the of that uh, capital intensive uh, production facility so global consolidation um, I talked talked a bit about this but it has to do with economies of scale again. It is the same sort of story over and over again um, with this uh, average cost In the high investment costs, variable costs divided by the by the output, the quantity. So, <coughs> uh, this simple equation has caused a lot of uh, lot of concern, uh, where the de the the product developers and the production facility developers <coughs> have seen that if we invest heavily in capital equipment, we get very low production costs per unit and when the number of units increase we get strong strong cost advantages from that. So it is the <coughs> it is again the same as we have seen where this is the variable cost curve and this is the average cost curve and the reason why it falls like this is the high investment costs so <coughs> what happens here is when you this is a demand when you uh, start production, um, let's say with not having exploited the possibility of consolidation, like for instance, um, there is a current discussion also in in this in this country w with centralization of uh, of inventories centralization of production factors, uh, production facilities. For instance, within the dairy industry, producing milk and cheese and things like that. So let's say that this is the situation at the outset. <coughs> and then you, you do the analysis and you find out that if you consolidate here, 
you might because if because if you have a well functioning transport network the the um, lost sales and uh, and uh, let's say the output in terms of uh, let's say relationships with the market is not affected by the consolidation but you can concentrate the demand to let's say a few or a few number of units or or even just one unit and then you you shift the average production costs downwards to a much lower level. So that is the workings behind consolidation. And in this picture, it's important to have in mind that this contains production costs and also and that is important here transport costs but this variable cost consists of these mainly of these two components you can also, you can of course uh, decompose production costs, you can introduce invent inventory costs, I can put that up as a separate one for the sake of order. Um, so this is, uh, this is an illustration of, uh, of a situation where everything is, is nice and uh, no no bottlenecks, nothing like that. But if then <coughs> a company decides to, to go forward with a consolidation strategy based on production costs only, without considering the two others, without, for instance, considering transport costs, they will they haven't done their job properly. Because if the transport costs are encumbered with bottlenecks, it can be lack of adequate infrastructure, it can be lack of competition in the transport industry, it can be, let's say, an, a, a less reliable transport network. This, such events will affect this nice picture. It might affect it by, for instance, as we increase the volume, x is here the volume, we are facing capacity problems in the transport network. So then, this is not a flat, nice, constant production cost curve anymore, but it may increase like this. And I just call that the width bottlenecks. For example, in transportation. And if you, you see, you easily see here what, what happens then. If demand increases, you don't gain much. Because then the costs, <coughs> you, will, you will not gain any cost advantage if you have bottlenecks in, in somewhere in the network, somewhere in the, in the supply chain, for instance, <coughs> within transportation. 
and uh, of course even without bottlenecks if you if you sort of this disregard or ignore the transport costs the the level of variable costs may be much higher but you see the point bottlenecks uh, can really distort the nice picture of uh, of economies of scale in this all right, <laughs> we are well over time, so we need to break again before we continue. 